One can think of the religions as autocratic, autocratic, or transcendent, or philosophical. or philosophical. So what does it mean for a faith system to be autocratic? I used that word in a book I wrote one time. I'm all tangled up here with this. There we go. I used that word in a book I wrote one time, and a college professor wrote to me, and he said, I have gone to dictionaries, and I just don't know what you mean by autocratic. So um, it's, a, it's a word I learned from a Dutch theologian many years ago, which I rather like because it describes to me what I want to say. An autocratic system means a system in which divinity and the material world have oneness, where the sacred and the divine and the material world have oneness. That's autocratic. Like the pyramids in Egypt. The pyramids in Egypt um, refer to an autocratic religious system where the Pharaoh was considered to be a son of the sun god. And so the pyramids you know, look like the rays of the sun coming down from the sun. <laughs> and the Pharaoh is buried in the center of that pyramid and he is buried on top of slaves who are to serve him in the next life, you see. That's an autocratic system where the divine pharaoh, uh, the divine pyramids, the divine sun, the slaves who die with the pharaoh are all part of this religious, spiritual, political, material system. It's all one. It has oneness, you see. Um, where Abraham came from, up there in, uh, in, um, in, in uh, present-day Iraq, in Haran, where he came from, the peoples in that region were very much influenced by a myth, a story, about Marduk. You may have studied about Marduk in your high school textbooks at one point or another. This Marduk was the son of the god Tiamat. And Tiamat was a very vicious mother goddess who with her tail would create chaos and disruption and storms and, and wars and so forth and so forth. She was a very violent goddess. And so Marduk decided to bring peace to the world by capturing his mother, Tiamat, in a net and then killing her and slicing her in two from top to bottom. And so the bottom part of Tiamat the blood and gore of his mother becomes the uh, stuff out of which uh, the earth and the universe are created. And the upper part of Tiamat becomes the stuff out of which the sky is created. And so the order comes to the world by killing this vicious, vicious God by her own son. Marta kills her, you see. That's the myth out of which Abraham came. That's autocratic. It's autocratic. It means that the earth is God, you see. And even dead gods are very dangerous stuff. And so you've got to be careful how you handle this divine goddess who has died in this violent way, you see. That's the autocratic system. I grew up in Tanzania, as you know, and let's just imagine that I am a, a participant, I'm a Zanaki, and a participant in this uh, worldview which was so prevalent among the Zanaki. So I'm walking along, and oh, 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 I stubbed my toe. I stubbed my toe on the branch, on, on the root of a tree going across the path. What happened? The nature god 
in that root, bit by toe. So I say, oh, I'm so sorry to have offended you. But next day, I'm walking along, and I stub my toe again. Oh, yo, 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 yo. This God's really out to get me. What am I going to do? So if it happens a third time, I will get a chicken. And I'll kill the chicken and pour the blood over the root in the, in the path. And I'll say, oh, God of the root, who has bitten me three times now, I'm so sorry to have offended you. Please calm down. And I'm going to put a bit of earth over top of you to pacify you. And then I'll make a trail around you. But you wouldn't think of getting an axe and cutting the root, would you? Because that root has bitten you. If you cut it, it will bite you for sure. But you offer the sacrifice of a chicken. So it will stop biting your toe so that you can now walk the path in peace. Untocratic worldview, you see. Where the gods and, um, and, and uh, the material reality have oneness. They're together. They have oneness. Okay? Now, that is a prevalent worldview all over the world. In fact, you might recall from your reading of the Bible that when Israel occupied Canaan, many times we read in the scriptures that they would cut down the trees on the hills the groves of trees on the hills. Why did they do that? It's because of this autocratic worldview, which they were in conflict with. Israel opposed that worldview. Because you see, what happened was these hills, these hills were thought of as, as a sign of pregnancy, the pregnant womb, you see. And so the trees, the trees, the groves of trees on the tops of these hills was where the pregnant womb and the uh, divine male sky <laughs> would meet each other and produce fertility. And so you would pray to these divinities, uh, to the autocratic gods of, 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 of the hill and of the trees, you see, for, for fertility to come to the soil. That was this autocratic worldview. Well, Israel, under God's command, uh, declared that these groves are not legit, you know, that God doesn't meet us on the hill uh, where the divine sky and divine earth meet each other. God meets us in our hearts. God meets us in his people, uh, not through worshiping groves and so forth. And so you had that conflict between Israel uh, and, and the local religious systems, uh, which was uh, quite, quite prevalent indeed, you see. So this autocratic system um, was challenged by Abraham and the faiths that followed the faith of Abraham. And so we call this challenge to the autocratic worldview transcendent. Transcendent. So you can think of religious systems also as transcendent systems. What does that mean? It means that God created, but he is other than the creation. The creation is not one with God. The creation is sustained by God, it is cared for by God, but it is not God. God created the trees, so we don't worship the trees. We care for them, but we don't worship the trees. God created the trees. A transcendent worldview, you see. A little bit like this desk. You could admire this desk and say, I wonder who ever built such a nice desk. But the desk is not the person who made it? The desk is other than the person. We see signs of his good workmanship or her good workmanship, but it is not the person. The person is other than, and so it is with God. God created, but he is other than the creation, transcendent. And so you can think of world religions as being participants in two huge systems of faith, you know, the autocratic systems where nature and divinity are one, or the transcendent systems, which are the Abrahamic faiths, which are Christian faith, Islam, and Judaism, which comprises half of the people in the world. And they have a mission. These Abrahamic faiths have a mission, and the mission is to bless all nations. That's their mission, to bless all nations. 
It's why my father and mother went to Tanzania among the Zanaki to be a blessing to the Zanaki people. Yeah. And then I often think of world religions also in a third way, which is philosophical, that doesn't exactly fit either the transcendent view of, of, uh, of, of the world or the, um, or the um, either the transcendent view or the autocratic system. And these, these would be philosophical systems. Uh, preeminent would be uh, Confucianism. Confucius was a philosopher. He was not a theologian. God, maybe there's a God, maybe not. He gave, didn't give any attention to those sorts of questions. He was concerned about organizing an ideology that, uh, that would um, be a blessing, a political blessing to the Chinese people. That's what he was about. Buddha, likewise, like I mentioned earlier, he was a philosopher. Uh, he uh, was not a theologian. He doubted if there's any God. So neither Confucius nor Buddha fit very well into this autocratic, transcendent uh, approaches to reality. Uh, they, they stand as religious, ideological, philosophical systems sort of off to their side. Socrates. Socrates would be an example of this. Plato, you know, Plato with his uh, logos, uh, his uh, universal principle. Uh, it wasn't a god that he worshipped. Uh, he doubted if there's, a, if there's any gods. Maybe there is, but he was concerned about the ideal good. Became an ideology. Karl Marx, you know, um, would be examples of ideologies, philosophical systems that don't fit into either the transcendent understanding or the autocratic understanding. And yet they're very influential uh, and contribute significantly to thinking about these ultimate questions that we talked about today. We invite you to participate in the International Bible Teaching and Gospel Sharing Project. Whether these Christian expanded educational opportunities will become available to people around the world depends on all of us. We very much need and appreciate your prayer and financial support. For more information, please visit tvsseminary.com. Now, and then this brings us to the last point uh, in my outline here, which is uh, that some religious systems <laughs> are missionary and some are not missionary. And the ones that are missionary are those that believe they have a mission to the whole world, which would be particularly, particularly Buddhism, Islam, and Christianity. These are faith systems that do marshal, oftentimes, sending of missionaries to societies where their faith or philosophy or theology is not known to proclaim uh, this, uh, this uh, conviction that they carry. And that's particularly true of the Muslim, of the Muslim movement and the Christian movement, uh, and to some extent also of the Buddhist movement. Yeah. Of these uh, faith systems, which would be the ones that would be uh, growing the most rapidly today? In terms of children, Islam is doing very well, growing very rapidly. But when you consider conversion growth, meaning people who were not either Muslim or Christian uh, and are seeking for a faith for the new world, for the new age in which we live today, uh, there generally is the Christian church that is growing the most rapidly. I was just in China very recently at, at a university and the university authorities were telling me that the estimate in China is that there's now 200 million Christians in China, which is just phenomenal. When you think that back in 1972, there was probably not more than 2 million Christians in China. Uh, so there's very rapid growth of the church in many parts of the world today. Uh, I grew up in East Africa, as you know, um, which is now about 60-70% uh, Christian. When I was born, there was almost no Christians at all. And so you do find considerable growth, particularly within the Christian movement. But Islam is, also, Islam is also experiencing some growth, but mostly, I would say, through children. I think that one, one of the uh, special challenges that Islam has in its missionary effort is the need to uh, embrace Arabic. Uh, the Quran is revealed in Arabic. The prayers are said in Arabic. And in a world today where people want to pray and worship in their own mother tongue, the Christian church with, with its message that God meets us in our own language. At Pentecost, people from every 
nation under heaven where they're praying and, 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 and praising God in their own language, that you don't need to leave your language. Uh, you embrace your language in the worship of God. I think that message by the church is extremely attractive. That old woman there among the Zanaki I told you about who held up that tattered Gospel of Matthew, the first book ever published in Zanaki, and she says, this book tells all about it. This book tells all about it. It was written in Zanaki, her own language, you see. So she could worship and praise God in her own language. She didn't need to learn to know another language. That is a huge asset that the global church has in its global missionary involvement.